and welcome to our webinar on the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapon and People's Campaign today, organized by uh, Jen Suikyo within the framework of uh, the Euro, Euro People's Forum. Uh, the biggest platform of uh, progressive people of the two continents. Uh, and it is a pleasure for me to, uh, and my senior colleague, uh, Corazon Fabros, uh, to be co-moderating this important webinar. Uh, as you know that, the world is now facing uh, great, profound, rapid, and complicated changes. The unprecedented COVID-19 is uh, completely changing the world with a serious effect on uh, the people. And uh, the world is focusing resources on the struggle against the pandemic. Uh, but uh, we should never forget an old threat that is nuclear weapon. Uh, and never forget that the current 13 1,400 nuclear weapons uh, in the world now can destroy hundreds of planets like our Mother Earth. Uh, it was a giant uh, achievement of peace level around the world that a legally binding treaty was adopted in uh, 2017. And it was another achievement that it entered into force on the 22nd of January this year with more than 50 countries having ratified. But uh, I think that we should uh, be aware that there are still problems. Even with the treaty, none of the nuclear weapon states have joined the treaty. And uh, no country under the US nuclear umbrella have joined the treaty. And our mission is to push the joining, the signing, and ratification of the treaty. Uh, another problem is uh, the ignorance of international law by countries, especially by big powers. Uh, even the UN Charter, uh, UNCLOS, and other legal documents are ignored and even reinterpreted in the interests of some countries. And of course, we do not want the TPNW to be treated like that. Uh, so another mission, the peace movement around the world, and uh, particularly in Asia and Europe, is to request the respect for and compliance with the treaty, with the TPNW, by all countries. And of course, there are more missions than, than what I have mentioned. In today's workshop, we will be hearing uh, reputable speaker who are famous diplomats and uh, peace activists. And uh, to start, to start the webinar today, I would like to invite uh, Ambassador Thomas Hanoshi, uh, Director for Disarmament, Arms Control and Non-Proliferation in the Austrian Federal Ministry for European and Internal international affair. Uh, Ambassador Hanoji was closely involved in drafting the anti-personnel My Ban Treaty, and more recently in bringing about the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapon. This reflects his particular interest in humanitarian disarmament and cooperation with civil society. Recently retired, he continues his engagement for humanitarian disarmament and is advising mayor for peace. Now, I would like to invite uh, Ambassador Thomas Hanoshi. The floor is yours. Well, thank you so much also for the kind introduction and dear participants in this webinar, esteemed activists against uh, uh, nuclear weapons, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It is a great pleasure and honor for me to speak to you today. Of course, I would have preferred to meet you in person, but this is not possible yet. The abolition of nuclear weapons is a necessity for the whole world. In Asia and Europe, the risk of a detonation of nuclear weapons is particularly high, since nuclear weapons are concentrated in these two continents, and eight out of nine nuclear armed states are located there. And we will never forget 
that the explosion of nuclear weapons 75 years ago over Japan brought immense suffering and death. Since then, the international community is demanding the total elimination of nuclear weapons and the legal norm to prohibit the most dangerous class of weapons of mass destruction. Given the devastating humanitarian consequences of nuclear weapons, humankind and our planet run the risk that uh, there will be no future due to a nuclear war. The fact that since 1945 nuclear weapons have not been used should not lull us to feel safe. As it was written in the report issued by the former Australian Foreign Minister Gareth Evans, together with the former Japanese Foreign Minister Yoriko Kawaguchi, and I quote from the report, so long as any such weapons remain, it defies credibility that they will not one day be used by accident, miscalculation or design. And any such use would be catastrophic. It is sheer luck that the world has escaped such catastrophe until now, unquote. When we look at the recent political and military developments, the feeling that our luck might be running out gets stronger. Never before has the famous doomsday clock been closer to midnight with only 100 minutes to go. One element is the destruction of the arms control and disarmament architecture. While I welcome that the New START treaty has been extended, the overall trend is still negative. All nuclear armed states have embarked on modernization programs. And this is a euphemistic term for developing new nuclear arms that are technically more sophisticated and more difficult to destroy on their way to the target. Also, small tactical nuclear weapons are being built again. They are called more usable, as if nuclear weapons could ever be used without creating havoc and grossly violating international law. Some of these so called small or low yield nuclear weapons are actually of a similar size to those dropped in 1945 over Hiroshima and Nagasaki. All those nuclear weapon programs are costing zillions of dollars, which should be used for better purposes in a world where there's so much poverty and health problems abound. The COVID-19 pandemic shows clearly that those countries wasting their taxpayers' money on nuclear weapon programs have set their priorities wrong. Where else could the huge savings necessary to cope with disease control and funding and economic rebound come from, if not from the expenditure for nuclear weapons. And yet, while these negative developments dominate the headlines, a revolution of sorts is also taking place. The majority of countries in the world have declared that they are unwilling to ignore the catastrophic humanitarian consequences of nuclear weapons. Dissatisfied with the repeatedly unfulfilled promises of disarmament in an indefinite future, a resounding 122 countries, nearly two thirds of the UN member states, adopted the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, the TPNW, on 7 July. 2017. Many of you from civil society personally contributed to this long sought for achievement. It was the cooperation of civil society and committed states that brought about this landmark treaty. It was an anomaly that all other classes of weapons of mass destruction, biological weapons, chemical weapons, uh, were forbidden, but not uh, this uh, kind of weapons of mass destruction uh, the, uh, that uh, is causing particularly civilian harm. 
but also uh, a number of uh, conventional weapons causing particular uh, high civilian harm like landmines and cast munitions had been explicitly prohibited before. In all those given examples, the destruction of the arsenals followed the prohibition norm. So the TPNW is a prerequisite for reaching and maintaining a world without nuclear weapons. The treaty obligations are comprehensive. Not only the use and threat of use of nuclear weapons is forbidden, but also to develop, test, produce, manufacture, otherwise acquire, possess, or stockpile, transfer, station them, or <clears throat> assist, encourage, or induce in any way anyone to engage in any activity prohibited under this treaty. The TPNW offers pathways towards the total elimination of nuclear weapons, demands victim assistance and environmental remediation, international cooperation and assistance, and national implementation. Already in its preambular part, there's a strong reference to the Non-Proliferation Treaty, the NPT, and the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. In fact, the TPNW is not only fully in line with the NPT, but complements it, since the full implementation of the disarmament Article 6 under the NPT is not possible without the prohibition norm. Politically, the TPNW took the monopoly on nuclear disarmament away from the nuclear armed states that consistently have blocked every attempt to achieve progress in multilateral nuclear disarmament settings since the adoption of the CTPT in 1996. As the survival of the whole planet is threatened by nuclear weapons, all states are affected and must have a say on nuclear disarmament. Finally, in 2016, the states in the various nuclear weapon-free zones and other active non-nuclear weapon states came together and took the initiative to pass a UN General Assembly resolution to start the negotiations of the Nuclear Prohibition Treaty. Regrettably, the nuclear armed states and most of those countries that want to be under a nuclear umbrella chose not to participate in the negotiations. This was a contradiction to Article 6 of the NPD that demands states parties to pursue negotiations in good faith on effective measures relating to nuclear disarmament. The opposition of nuclear armed states and umbrella states underlines the relevance of the DPNW and reflects also their reluctance to live up to their commitment given in the outcome document of the 2010 uh, NPT review conference to achieve the peace and security of a world without nuclear weapons. Since this cannot be reached without a prohibition norm. With the entry into force of the TPNW on the 22nd of January of this year, there can be no doubt that the TPNW has become part of the international disarmament and non-proliferation architecture. <coughs> As of today, 54 states parties and 86 signatory states are extending an open hand to those states that have opposed the treaty before and are inviting them to attend the first meeting of states parties next January in Vienna as observers. This shows not only the inclusiveness of the TPNW supporters, but also makes a significant contribution towards narrowing differences. The support for the TPNW is constantly growing. Last December, uh, the UN General Assembly adopted a resolution calling for signature and ratification of the TPNW with 130 yes votes. ICANN, representing civil society, 
was awarded the well-deserved Nobel Peace Prize for the TPNW. And civil society is helping to get more and more countries to join the treaty and hopefully will be successful also in convincing many states to participate as observers in the first meeting of states parties. We have to acknowledge that some countries do not want to live in a world without nuclear weapons because they believe in the concept of nuclear deterrence as the pillar for their security policy. Logically, history went its course and it cannot be proved whether nuclear deterrence worked or did not work during the Cold War. But today, in an age of cyber hacking, hypersonic missiles, and the multipolar world, we know that this Cold War concept is not practicable anymore. What reliance on extended nuclear deterrence really means is that nuclear disarmament is not desired. When a country bases its future security policy on the continued existence of nuclear weapons, its declarations in favor of nuclear disarmament lack credibility. What is needed instead is planning how to get to a world without nuclear weapons and security without nuclear weapons. History has taught us that nuclear weapons cannot bring security, only death, suffering, environmental catastrophes and irresponsible risks. The huge sums invested in nuclear weapons could be better invested in addressing the real challenges to our security, such as disease, poverty, hunger, effects of climate change, and so on. For national security always means the security of people living in a given state, not an abstract term sacrificing the security of the individual citizen. Support for the TPNW continues to grow. Polls show that even in countries opposing the TPNW, a majority of the population is in favor of joining the treaty. Civil society can and will influence political parties to heed to the will of the majority of voters. Endurance and patience will be needed, but persistent engagement prevails. Most importantly, the TPNW has become a beacon of hope that a world without nuclear weapons is not mere wishful thinking, but achievable and the only realistic guarantee for the survival of mankind. I thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador. Um, I like uh, the idea that in uh, now in the in the age of cyber hacking, uh, uh, nuclear weapon. I, I think that nuclear weapon is becoming more and more dangerous. And the second, that nuclear weapon is not bringing about uh, security, but it brings about debt. And also, I think that poverty. It brings about poverty. And uh, now uh, uh, I would like to open uh, uh, the forum for question for Q and A. Uh, but I myself have uh, the first two questions for Ambassador. Sure. Uh, the first one: uh, All nuclear umbrella states are under military alliance with the U.S. or NATO. How? Should this country deal with the military alliance issue if or when they join the treaty? The second question Article 6 and 7 of the treaty are called paucity obligation for the victims. Actually, there is a growing voices of the Hibakusha and other victims. Uh, that they should be given justice and compensation. Can this article be applied to the damage of atomic bombing and nuclear testing? The two questions. Yeah. Should I answer immediately? 
Okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, uh, well, uh, I mean, formally, of course, uh, uh, umbrella states, uh, almost all of them are in, are in an alliance uh, treaty uh, with the US, but actually some are not formally in an alliance treaty. And uh, uh, what we have seen uh, also in the uh, voting pattern, uh, also uh, other nuclear weapon states have a couple of uh, states that uh, uh, depend on them or believe to depend on them for their security. Uh, so it's very important always uh, to highlight that uh, this is not directed, the deep endeavor uh, is not directed at particular states. It's about the weapons. And regardless uh, uh, whether you are formally or not formally in an alliance, as long as you reckon that a nuclear weapon states uh, will be the basis for your security policy, uh, uh, applying nuclear weapons, you're in the same boat. Now, uh, concerning NATO, it's interesting because in the legal basis of NATO, in the Washington Treaty, there's no mentioning at all of nuclear weapons. So uh, certainly it is possible uh, that a NATO member uh, joins the DPNW and uh, then, of course, would uh, uh, adapt uh, its uh, participation in NATO. It would not take part in the nuclear planning group, but, but that has happened before. Uh, there was a NATO state that didn't participate actually too in this uh, group. Um, and uh, uh, so what is lacking, of course, uh, or required is political will. And then you have to adjust your participation in uh, the alliance. Of course, the present uh, uh, strategy uh, includes the nuclear element, but um, also in the past, there had been footnotes in which uh, a certain country uh, would dissociate itself uh, from, from a passage. So this might become very interesting when a, a NATO country decides to join the DPNW or any other uh, uh, nuclear weather states also in Asia. Uh, uh, what it takes is, of course, uh, a readjustment of your policy, but you could fulfill your obligations. On the second question, uh, yes, indeed, uh, it's one of the great advances in uh, nuclear disarmament that for the first time a treaty dealing with nuclear disarmament contains uh, language on victim assistance and environmental uh, remediation. And this is applicable both to the victims of nuclear bombing, uh, um, but also to the victims of nuclear testing. And uh, uh, I remember vividly uh, how uh, big the joy of the Hibakushas was when the treaty uh, was adopted. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ambassador. And now uh, we are waiting for uh, more questions. If you have any more questions. I mean, there's a Q&A box at all. Okay. Sao để máy đưa lên chị lấy cho anh? Không để đấy. Uh, Lisa, okay. So we like uh, Lisa, the floor is thank yours. You. Thank you, Ambassador Hanachi. Thank you so much. That was very useful for all of us who've uh, uh, been been following these issues for a long time. Um, I'd like to continue along 
the note of what you were saying about uh, NATO member states or states that are under the umbrella. Uh, as you know, I live in Italy and we're very active in the campaign in Italy. Um, can you give us some advice as to how to structure a campaign? I think we should start on a proper campaign with Italy, Belgium, the Netherlands and Germany, the countries that host a very small number now of US nuclear weapons and somehow uh, join together our forces in order to ask for a program, for a schedule, for having these nuclear weapons removed from these countries, because obviously that is a prerequisite before we can become, we could become members of the TPNW. Uh, even, and I agree with you on what you said, that it is possible to remain a NATO member state uh, and be part of the TPNW, but not if we have US nuclear weapons on our territory. Am I right? Yeah. Yeah, Lisa, it's nice to see you. Of course, uh, you are right. And therefore, the treaty contains specific language uh, that a country that wants to join and has uh, uh, nuclear weapons stationed on its territory has, of course, uh, to end this. Uh, I think every one of us understands you cannot have the cake and eat it. You cannot have the nuclear weapons uh, on your territory and uh, be for the prohibition at the same time of nuclear weapons. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, these are the just uh, five states in NATO that have uh, nuclear weapons and uh, they are uh, uh, almost 30 NATO members. So the majority doesn't have them, but uh, those uh, that have them, of course, and if they want to join, it's the first step. Uh, that um, uh, the stationing of weapons should end. And indeed, in these countries, there there is discussion in this. It will be a topic in the German election campaign because a number of parties are quite uh, openly uh, against it. Uh, and it's also interesting that the US, uh, on its own initiative, has reduced the number of those nuclear weapons in uh, Europe stationed in NATO countries. Uh, which was not uh, really presented a lot in media, but uh, it can also be interpreted as another sign, actually for defense purposes, it is not so important. You do not really need it. Uh, a final comment, uh, in the same document, uh, the strategic uh, concept of uh, NATO in 2010, you also find an interesting sentence, commits NATO to the goal of creating the conditions for a world without nuclear weapons, which I think is very positive. And certainly the TPNW is one of the conditions uh, that you have to uh, fulfill in order to get to a world without nuclear weapons, because there's no world without nuclear weapons when these weapons are not prohibited and we shouldn't forget even when all of them are destroyed, you need the prohibition norm because the knowledge how to build these weapons will still remain. Thank you. Thank you very much for, thank you for Lisa's uh, question and uh, the ambassador's responses. Uh, other participants, I would like to, I, I would like those who want to ask, please raise hand. Uh, another question from the chat box, Ambassador Hanoshi. Can you talk about the plans for the first meeting of state party next January? Yeah, I can do so, of course. Uh, and next, uh, we wish you. Okay, okay, please. Uh, please. It will be the first uh, meeting of state parties, so it's very important uh, that uh, this meeting uh, will be a full success because uh, uh, you set uh, the pattern also for the following uh, meetings. Uh, uh, we have already the designated chair. It's my successor uh, as head of the Austrian disarmament department, Alexander Mendt, who is a very experienced and knowledgeable uh, disarmament expert. 
And uh, he has started uh, his uh, consultations uh, among state parties. Uh, uh, we are planning to have this meeting, uh, not uh, just a procedural meeting, but it should be really interesting on substance and uh, bring progress. And uh, as I've mentioned already, I think, uh, especially for campaigners in countries like uh, uh, Japan, uh, in countries that are under the nuclear umbrella, it would be a very good first step uh, to get uh, colleagues from this country uh, to the meeting to participate. Uh, uh, I think uh, this could be uh, uh, of uh, quite some importance and we will hear later about the debate in, in Belgium and so on. So quite a number of countries uh, uh, this would help a little bit uh, to uh, lower uh, the barrier for those countries. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, the um, uh, Ambassador. Uh, I saw Shiro's hands, but uh, from the chat box, the question has been translated. I came to know Austria will host the first call of TPNW in January 2022. What is the aim and position of this meeting? And let me know your resolution as a host country. Maybe you have uh, responded to this. Do you want to add some more information? No, I, I think uh, I have uh, more or less uh, re responded uh, to the question. Uh, uh, I think it's very fitting that the first meeting of states parties is uh, taking place in Vienna uh, first of all, nuclear disarmament has its uh, international organizations. Think of the IEA, of the CTPTO in Vienna. So uh, there are many multilateral diplomats also there who really have a good knowledge on the nuclear disarmament issues. And secondly, my country, of course, played uh, quite a leading role in bringing about the TPNW. And for me, it was a given at the very end, at the adoption, that I will take the floor and already invite uh, everyone to come to the first meeting of states parties in Vienna, which uh, was very uh, well received by the other states parties. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, I think that we uh, should all say thanks to Austria. Uh, and uh, uh, another question, another question. Um, Translation of the question raised by Mr. Koji Gotu of Itoshima City. Uh, although the city council had adopted a resolution calling on the Japanese government to sign and ratify the TPNW, the Cell Defense Forces conducted exercise in public space. This contradicts the opinion of the public opinion, the majority of whom are calling for the abolition with 30% of Japan municipality adopting the resolution supporting the treaty in these circumstances, what we citizens can do? Well, I think first of all, you have elections and uh, 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 politicians are always sensitive uh, to uh, uh, the demands of the electorate. Uh, and we have seen this also uh, in some elections in Europe, that it can be an important uh, issue in an election campaign, of course. I mean, there are domestic policy issues that uh, uh, concern the lives of the uh, people very directly. But I think uh, this uh, uh, pathway uh, to use local uh, leaders, mayors for peace, uh, uh, the city appeal of uh, ICANN, uh, that's a very efficient way uh, because uh, um, uh, actually when you look how many of the major cities have already signed up, I mean you find Washington, you find Paris and so on, you find even nuclear weapon states, the major cities, and uh, there's a lot of population there and I think uh, we should continue this, as I said, we will need some endurance. It's not happening overnight. But uh, at the end of the day, it's the voter who decides. Thank you. 
Ah, uh, very, uh, very. Uh, I think that interesting uh, question has there been any discussion with Biden's administration? Ah, oh. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, first of all, uh, I mean, of course, uh, we always uh, have discussions uh, with, with our uh, diplomatic colleagues from from other countries. But uh, uh, I think I don't reveal a big secret that we have an excellent uh, dialogue with the U.S. administration. And uh, they are still in the review. And we are, of course, interested to see uh, uh, what the change of administration uh, will mean with regard to, to the positioning of the U.S. Uh, to the uh, treaty. Uh, I think some of you might have listened to the leading uh, uh, people on disarmament in the former in the Obama uh, administration, uh, and uh, those speak quite positively about the treaty. They see a merit in the treaty. Of course, they are not uh, going that far that they say the U.S. Uh, should uh, join now. Uh, but uh, I think it is helpful when the nuclear weapon states. Uh, Please, they're campaigning uh, against uh, uh, the DPNW because uh, it just uh, um, brings further division, uh, or deepens the already existing division, uh, and we all want to work together uh, to achieve nuclear disarmament. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. And uh, please raise your hand if you have any question. If you have any uh, question to Ambassador Please raise your hand. Uh, from uh, Keita Takagaki, what do you have expectation for Japanese youth for promoting the TPNW? Oh, the role of the youth. Yeah. Well, the role of the youth is very important. Uh, one of the features of ICANN that uh, impressed me uh, very positively uh, was that they were uh, highly skilled people that could be my children. They, they are younger. And uh, uh, at the end of the day, uh, we have to get more interest uh, among younger people for the issue of nuclear disarmament. Uh, uh, my prime minister, when he was foreign minister, uh, uh, added to, to a speech uh, that we had prepared for him on nuclear disarmament in the General Assembly. Uh, I'm quite young. When uh, I uh, uh, learned about the end of the Cold War, I thought that the danger of nuclear weapons would be more or less over. But uh, in the meantime, I'm very much aware that this is not over. And uh, I mean, there are two major uh, dangers for the world. One is, of course, nuclear weapons, and the other one is, is climate change. And uh, they are closely interlinked because once nuclear weapons explode, you get nuclear winter and all this uh, climate uh, phenomena that would lead to the starvation of millions of people. Uh, so uh, I hope that youth will even more embark on making nuclear disarmament a main issue. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I, I also agree that the, the youth should play a very important role, but how to involve them is a question. For example, I'm wondering if I am the youngest here in this uh, webinar. <laughs> uh, and another question from my friend Paru Tarek. Uh, my question, I want to hear Ambassador's view on the mad race of Pakistan and India for nuclear weapon the danger it poses to the world peace? Well, of course, uh, it's a case that is highly dangerous because uh, you have two neighboring countries that mm -hmm. have been in armed confrontation already four times. Uh, 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 and uh, if uh, such an armed confrontation would spill over to uh, using nuclear weapons, 
it will be a catastrophe uh, for them both, of course, because uh, you know once you use nuclear weapons, uh, you also do a lot of damage to yourself. And that's, the good thing is, I think they both know it. But still, uh, and um, I was quite impressed by a comment of a former uh, Indian uh, uh, general. Uh, who told uh, at the meeting, we as military people, we cannot use uh, nuclear weapons. We know exactly what would be the effect. And uh, it's, it's not a usable uh, arm, but it's, it's an arm that the politicians like. And uh, there might be something uh, uh, in, in this remark. Uh, so it's very important that uh, we get uh, also in South Asia, uh, uh, to real progress on nuclear disarmament and risk reduction. Mm. Mm. Okay. And the conf uh, confrontation between the two neighboring countries are making a nuclear weapon their own uh, more dangerous. Uh, another question from Ebiko uh, Hirano. My question, how do you think the situation regarding Iran nuclear program evolved? Is Iran ready to have dialogue? With the U.S., mm. yeah, I think that's the million-dollar question. <laughs> I, I I think it's very positive that finally we have uh, now talks again on reviving the JCPOA, and uh, I, I really hope that they will make progress. I understand uh, that also for domestic uh, policy reasons, uh, it's not easy for, for Iran and they also will have elections, I think, in June. Uh, but uh, I mean, uh, once this uh, uh, arrangement, this agreement totally collapses, what is the alternative? The alternative might be that uh, several countries in the Middle East uh, go uh, nuclear, uh, more or less a collapse of uh, decades of uh, non-proliferation uh, um, efforts, uh, and it would be extremely dangerous. Uh, so I think uh, we are all interested, and also I think both sides, the US and uh, Iran, that uh, the talks will lead to a success. Mm, okay, thank you for your positive uh, view. Uh, any more question from the participant? Please raise hand. Hiroshi Takakusaki, furnish of the Austrian government position for the abolition is very impressive. How is people in your country supporting its position? Ah, it's a very nice question. Yeah, a very nice question, but it's true. Yes. Actually, uh, in my country, uh, our engagement uh, uh, for uh, nuclear disarmament is one of the very rare issues on which all political forces agree. Uh, so uh, in Parliament, of course, the ratification of the DPNW uh, received unequivocal support. Uh, I think it comes also from the fact that Austria uh, was uh, at the very hot spot in the Cold War, and we understood that our role in a nuclear confrontation would be the role of the victims. And mm. there's some uh, awareness how dangerous these weapons are, <coughs> since there were plans by nuclear weapon states uh, in case there's a confrontation to drop nuclear weapons was over uh, my country. And uh, uh, so nationally, already in 1999, uh, we prohibited uh, uh, most of the uh, issues that are prohibited in Article uh, 1 of the DPNW. Uh, so uh, that facilitated it for us that we could uh, be a leading force uh, in uh, the process uh, to the uh, the TPNW, because we had done our homework already in 1999. 
Thank you. Mm, okay, thank you. And I think that the majority of the global population uh, are in support of uh, the abolition of nuclear weapon. Uh, another question from Lisa. Lisa, please. Please unmute, unmute. Uh, please, there we are. Please. I apologize. I apologize. Now I'm unmuted. Um, Thomas, I just wanted to let you know that it was on the example of the Austrian clause declaring uh, Austria nuclear free that we modeled a uh, people's legislation proposal in Italy and we connect, collected enough signatures in 2008 to submit legislation to parliament in Italy absolutely modeled on your, I think it's a constitutional law, isn't it? Your, yeah, it the is one right, it is. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, making it a single state nuclear weapon free uh, zone. So, and we wanted to do that, but the Italian so, parliament was too cowardly even to discuss our proposal. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Lisa. And uh, uh, it's 4 p.m. now. Uh, thank you, Ambassador Thomas. Hello, C. Pleasure. And uh, we just completed the first part of the webinar, and now we are going to the second part. I would like to uh, invite uh, my senior colleague, uh, Cora Fabros, to uh, moderate the second session. Okay, thank you, Ko. Um... I observe you keep uh, emphasizing the senior <laughs> there, <laughs> but I don't mind that. <laughs> uh, again, uh, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, uh, I thank you for coming. Now we come into the second part of our webinar, uh, equally important, I think, uh, because it speaks of uh, the people's campaign. Uh, and, and so uh, with that, uh, I'd like to introduce, uh, we have, you know, important uh, panelists, uh, five of them coming from different uh, areas of the world, all of them engage. I don't need to mention for how long. <laughs> it's uh, it's uh, across uh, generations, in fact. And, um, Allow me to introduce uh, Yayoi Tuchida from Japan. Uh, we also have Jin Young Kim of Korea, um, Achin Van Eyck of uh, India. Uh, we have Ludo Brabander uh, from uh, Belgium. And we have Lisa Clark from Italy. So I would uh, introduce them more properly in a while as they uh, prepare to speak, but uh, let me call on Yayo Chichida, who is the Assistant Secretary General of uh, uh, Japan Council Against ANH Bombs or Nihon uh, Genesikyo to please uh, take the virtual floor. <laughs> Yayo, over to you. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. It sounds okay. On January 22nd this year, the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons came into effect, making nuclear weapons illegal for the first time in human history. Celebrating this achievement together with the Hibakusha, A-bomb survivors, we took actions at more than 150 locations nationwide. At the new stage of nuclear weapons being prohibited, we launched a signature campaign on October 29th last year, urging the government of Japan to sign and ratify the treaty. Northeast Asia, where Japan is located, remains a nuclear flashpoint with North Korean nuclear issue being unsettled. In addition, the Biden administration's strategy to contain China and China's hegemonic activities violating international law have led to intensifying US-China conflicts and tensions 
military exercises and military buildup in the region. If a military conflict occurs in the South China Sea or the Taiwan Strait, the danger of nuclear weapons being used becomes a reality. As an equal partner of the United States, the Japanese government is going, is going hand in hand with the US regarding China and North Korea as threats and committing to involving in Taiwan issue. Faced with this crisis, eliminating nuclear threats is an urgent task for Japan and Asia. It is none other than the, res the result of competition and arms race based on nuclear deterrence by nuclear weapon states and umbrella states. We must bury their false idea of protecting world peace and security by nuclear deterrence. In addition, while the Japanese government says that it will lead the abolition of nuclear weapons as the only atomic bombed country, the reality is that it opposes the TPNW, try to maintain nuclear deterrence and has become a spokesperson for nuclear weapon states. The resolution of the Japanese government entitled Joint Courses of Action and Future-Oriented Dialogue Towards a World Without Nuclear Weapons, submitted to the UN General Assembly in 2020, distorted the agreements of the NPT's past review conferences and deleted the word implementation of the agreements. Of course, it received strong criticism from the international community. In talks with the Japan's foreign ministry I attended in February, they admitted that the removal of the word implementation was to get the US and UK to become co-sponsors of the resolution. It is a shame that the government throws away the authority of the abled country and cannot conduct diplomacy as an independent country in subordination to the US. We demand that the Japanese government should take the lead in the abolition of nuclear weapons as the only abled country and to carry out diplomacy based on the Charter of the United Nations and the Constitution. If the government joins the treaty, this will bring about a major shift in Japan's nuclear umbrella and security policy and will also become a great contribution to achieving a world without nuclear weapons and the peace and security of Asia. For this purpose, we have to increase public awareness that the US, China, and Japan should stop military first policies. In this respect, the treaty empowers us. The treaty calls on the world to shift from peace and security by nuclear deterrence to peace and security of a world without nuclear weapons. Starting the signature campaign, we realized that there is widespread interest and support for the treaty among, among the public. A total of 137 prominent people from all over the country, including world famous musician Ryuichi Sakamoto and former foreign minister Makiko Tanaka have become joint proposers of the campaign. In opinion polls, 72% of the population said the government should join the treaty. So far, 550, sorry, 560 local governments, 31% of all of them, have adopted resolutions to urge the Japanese government to join the treaty. In some prefectures, the Signature Campaign Promotion Committee started to be formed.
I saw an article in Asahi Shimbun newspaper some days ago in which a senior U.S. nuclear strategy official of the Biden administration said that the TPNW was not the right way, but understandable because it had the same goal. Now is the time to promote the treaty, which is the key to achieving peace and security of a world free of nuclear weapons. The NPT review conference is scheduled for August this year. We must urge nuclear weapon states to implement the obligations of Article 6 of the NPT and the agreements of the past NPT review conferences to eliminate their nuclear arsenals. And at the latest, in October this year, there will be a general election that will influence Japan's future. We are determined to play a role as a movement of the abled country by creating a big swell of public opinion and actions. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Ayoy. I'm sorry. Uh, um, and, and thank you for uh, taking up uh, and uh, informing us about the important work that uh, Gensikyo and, uh, and the Japanese uh, uh, movements uh, are doing to, uh, to uh, pursue uh, this work on uh, nuclear uh, disarmament. Uh, not only uh, through the work with government uh, lobbying, uh, but more importantly, uh, organizing uh, the grassroots in Japan. Uh, at this point, I just would like to bring you up to date on, you know, there are now about 111 uh, uh, participants in our webinar um, coming from different countries, about 15 countries. Uh, being represented across sectors uh, and uh, across uh, geographical locations um, and across generations as well. And uh, uh, more importantly, we have some friends uh, from the East Coast of the United States, you know. Uh, you can imagine what time it is uh, at this point and we would like to thank them. I have been also told that uh, uh, our uh, uh, important, uh, you know, always important ally, uh, uh, Mr. Sergio Duarte, uh, uh, the former UN uh, High Commit representative for disarmament affairs are, are with us. I, I'm not sure if I see him, but we'd like to acknowledge uh, his presence and also that we have in our midst today, uh, many hibakushas uh, led by its uh, chairperson, uh, Terumi Tanaka. So thank you very much. Arigato gozaimasu uh, I'd like to call on now, uh, a call on our next uh, a panelist, um, a, a very young, active and dedicated activist from South Korea, uh, Kim Jin Young, who heads the, uh, uh, who is a full-time organizer at the People's Solidarity for Social Progress. Uh, and in charge of the anti-nuclear uh, and peace activities and international solidarity projects over at the uh, at, uh, PSSP. So over to you, Jin Yang. You have Hello, the floor. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Oh, great. Uh, I'm not that, that young. I'm sorry now, so, <laughs> okay. I want to talk about why I need, I think we need the TPNW in Northeast Asia. Last year, Korean civil society launched its first petition campaign to urge the South Korean government and the world to join the TPNW. Even in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic, we had press conferences and online actions in solidarity with the peace wave. 
Since the South Korean government, which relies on the U.S. nuclear umbrella, has taken no action with regards to the DPNW despite its successful entry into force, we will continue to raise our voices calling for South Korea's participation in the DPNW. Recently, on April 7th, South Korea held mayoral elections in Seoul and Busan, the first and second largest cities in the country, and we are now heading into the presidential election in March of next year. In last week's elections, the ruling Democratic Party lost badly. The main factor was the economic policy failures and corruption scandals. But the election was also affected by the fact that inter-Korean talks, which had been seen as the Moon, Moon Jae-in administration's biggest achievement, has completely faltered. North Korea's blowing up of inter-Korean joint liaison office in June 2020 and the steering of a South Korean civilian in September gave rise to the perception that the summit shows which led to no substantial denuclearization or disarmament were in fact meaningless. President Moon's term will end in less than a year. Therefore, the possibility of new inter-Korean dialogue is slim. While former U.S. President Trump and President Moon exchanged personal letters with North Korean leader Kim Jong-un, North Korea's nuclear weapons became an even more serious concern in Northeast Asia. It recently showed off the world's largest ICBM and a new SLBM. These strategic weapons are leading to a nuclear domino effect in the region. They are, they are the basis for the claim that since the U.S. will not provide nuclear umbrellas to South Korea and Japan, even at the risk of North Korea's nuclear attack, South Korea and Japan should also arm themselves with nuclear weapons. North Korean leader Kim Jong-un ordered the development of tactical nuclear weapons for the first time in January this year. He is believed to have done this with South Korea and Japan in mind. The Workers' Party of Korea Convention, which is actually above the North Korean constitution, was also revised to specify reunification based on strong national defense instead of the phrase peaceful reunification. Last year, the U.S. government formalized its characterization of the relationship between the U.S. and China as strategic competition. I think this competition is already underway in Northeast Asia. The Biden administration is preparing to build intermediate range missiles in the region. This may be recruited in South Korea or Japan. This news is reminiscent of the past when the U.S.-Soviet confrontation led to a plan to place person to NSS-20 nuclear missiles in Europe. In addition, China's domestic and foreign policies such as Chinese Dream and One Dance One World clearly indicate its intention to strengthen military hegemony in Northeast Asia. We must oppose the militarism of both the U.S. and China. The only solution is to this uh, the, the only solution to this situation is a mass movement that is opposed to all nuclear weapons and aims for peace and security for all people. We must demand that the U.S. and China stop their conflicts and arms race, call for discussions on nuclear disarmament that covers not only the U.S. and Russia, but also China, and urge North Korea to take further steps towards uh, denuclearization. But certainly, we have great tools. The declaration of denuclearization of Korean Peninsula, Japan's peace constitution, and the three non nuclear principles can serve our, as our guiding framework. If South Korea and Japan were to join the DPNW, they would not only be living up to new global standards, but also gaining substantial levers to pressure neighboring countries to scrap their nuclear policies. Thank you for listening.
thank you Jin Yang uh, <laughs> um, uh, for uh, for that uh, sharing from uh, Korea and um, a special uh, an important uh, angle of our discourse when it comes to uh, nuclear uh, weapons issue um, and uh, before uh, I, I continue to move to call on our next panelist I just like to encourage our speakers to uh, move the microphone closer to to their, you know, to uh, so that we can hear them uh, more clearly, uh, and uh, also that uh, uh, so that uh, and also that for the participants who have started to think of your questions, so if you can please uh, uh, write them in the chat box. Uh, so that it could be translated if it needs to be translated uh, and uh, if possible uh, to inform us uh, to whom you'd like to direct your question. Okay, so at this point, I'd like to uh, introduce our next panelist. Uh, uh, many of you know him <laughs> from way back. Um, one of the leading lights of the peace and uh, security uh, campaigns, uh, especially in South Asia, uh, Achin Van Eyck, uh, who is uh, a uh, retired, but not definitely not tired <laughs> uh, of, uh, of working on, on, on our campaigns. Uh, he is a retired professor of the Delhi University and uh, he has written uh, uh, several books, actually, uh, on studies on India foreign policy. And I think uh, I have to mention this. He is a fellow of the Transnational Institute, uh, and uh, especially that he is one of the uh, awardees of uh, the uh, of the. Sean McBride uh, 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 Award that is uh, given by the International Peace Bureau every year. So, Achin, uh, you have the virtual floor, please. <clears throat> thank you, Paula, and uh, thank you for having me on this panel. I would like to focus on South Asia because this is where the danger of a nuclear breakout and exchange is greatest. Nowhere else do you have two territorially contiguous nuclear weapon states, two nuclear weapon states that share a border, India and Pakistan. And that, as the Austrian ambassador pointed out, have had four major conventional wars. China and Russia had a border, both nuclear weapons, but they do not have the same history of conflict or continuous hostility that India and Pakistan have had. India and Pakistan had their nuclear tests in 1998. And just one year after, in 1999, they had their fourth major conventional war. They had both acquired nuclear weapons. And during that war in 1999, both sides had actually prepared their nuclear weapons for possible use. Both sides said, we don't want to have a nuclear war, but the other side might do it, and therefore we have to be prepared. Fortunately, that war came to a halt quickly. But as for the Cold War, this Cold War has continued since the birth of these two countries in 1947 for over 70 years. And there is no sign of ending of this Cold War. Indeed, in 2018-19, there were armed clashes across the border and there was a suicide bomb attack by a local Kashmiri connected to a Islamist group in Pakistan, which killed 40 soldiers. What was the Indian reaction? For the first time, India sent a plane deep into the territory of Pakistan to drop conventional bombs. 
please note since the nuclear age began in 1945 this is the first time that a nuclear weapons power has sent an air attack deep into the country into the territory of another nuclear weapons in fact another first these two countries in 2018 19 had air clashes across the border this too is something that no other nuclear weapon states have had hmm? so how do we bring about greater nuclear sanity regionally and globally now in the peace and anti nuclear movements everywhere we make proposals and demands on nuclear weapon states not because we think their governments will easily listen or readily accept them but because our purpose is to generate greater awareness among the general public to oppose and pressurize their governments whether these governments are nuclear weapon states or not there are many such important demands that are raised such as calling for the remaining countries to sign and ratify the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons we raise the demand to oppose ballistic and missile tetter missile defense systems that only promote further arms racing and indeed the nuclearization militarization of outer space itself and so on. there are many other demands that we also raise generally on the global scale and there are also demands that we raise to try to improve and promote nuclear restraint between india and pakistan but here i want to focus on one particular effort concerning bangladesh which is the only country so far in south asia that has both signed and ratified the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons afghanistan has not signed the treaty nepal has signed the treaty but not ratified it hmm? bangladesh historically has been the one neighbor with the courage to strongly criticize the indian and pakistani militarization with calls from some of its strategic experts some of the strategic experts from bangladesh to even call for a south asian nuclear weapons free zone indeed and this is very important in august 2011 an mp from the ruling party the national awami party then in 2011 which is also the ruling party now this mp placed a draft bill in the bangladesh parliament saying that bangladesh could become like mongolia a single state nuclear weapons free zone it didn't go through but this is the one country in south asia that has actually did this the bangladesh reality needs to be taken advantage of through collaboration between identified progressive organizations inside bangladesh and others outside such as the anti nuclear groups in india pakistan and elsewhere including the two nobel prize winning bodies the international position for the prevention of nuclear war and ican we should and can organize a conference with international as well as local participants in dhaka in the post covid 2022 period and the principal agenda i believe of this international conference should be south asian nuclear restraint and disarmament measures in so far as there are ngos and bodies in bangladesh which are supportive and sympathetic this can certainly be done and the bangladesh government can be put to put pressure on and they would i think agree to give visas for people to come from outside this event if we are able to hold it incidentally here there is from the, uh, there is uh, i think a representative from the position of social responsibility among the audience i believe we also have a representative of the international position for the prevention of nuclear war 
an icon, of course. Um, so this event, if it is held in Bangladesh, can also be the occasion when a high-powered representative delegation comprising representatives from the different anti-nuclear movements, as well as from ICANN, IPPNW, and so on, should meet senior government officials in Bangladesh to assure a stronger post-TPNW international backing for Bangladesh to revive the idea of its moving either in the direction of having, like Mongolia, a single state nuclear weapons free zone, or even consider negotiating with the Bangkok Treaty members, that is the Southeast Asian nuclear weapons free zone countries, that they should consider negotiating with them to extend the existing Bangkok Treaty to include Bangladesh. There are historical precedents for this. The Treaty of Tatla Lolko, the Latin American nuclear weapons free zone, was extended to include countries in the Caribbean. And there was pressure on Rara Tonga, that is the South Pacific nuclear weapons free zone, to also extend itself to try and include other islands like the Marshall Islands and so on. Mm -hmm. If something like this were to take place in Bangladesh, it would be very important, either of these outcomes, extending the Bangkok Treaty or Bangladesh as a single state nuclear weapons free zone, either of these outcomes would politically and morally jolt India and Pakistan, thereby giving a tremendous boost to all those struggling for a nuclear free zone. It would be indeed a very important political slap to two governments that deserve this. And it would considerably increase enthusiasm in South Asia, in other countries, Nepal, in India, and Pakistan, to actually push more strongly for a South Asian nuclear weapons uh, zone, also as free of nuclear weapons regionally, as well as globally. I really believe that this project of planning to make an intervention in Bangladesh along these lines is something that is definitely worth pursuing. Thank you very much. Thank you, Achin, and uh, thank you very much for that very uh, strong call, uh, uh, an update uh, on uh, the situation in South Asia, but particularly uh, the strong call for a uh, convening of a conference uh, that would uh, move <coughs> towards a direction of a South Asian nuclear weapons free zone treaty, and also bringing up an important dimension of uh, the work of uh, uh, the peace movement uh, looking into the uh, single state uh, experience of Mongolia, um, uh, which I think at this point I would like to say that uh, the International Peace Bureau uh, is uh, having a, a webinar next week, uh, particularly on uh, a, a new uh, looking at uh, the nuclear weapons free zones policy. So uh, we will we, we'll invite everyone to that uh, event as well. Um, uh, uh, let me uh, at this point uh, call on our uh, fourth uh, panelists. Uh, we're moving to Europe now. And I'd, I'd like to call on uh, Ludo Brabander from uh, Belgium, uh, who is uh, a Belgian peace activist and a spokesperson for the uh, organization Vrede. <laughs> uh, I don't know whether I pronounce it right. And he is one of uh, the organizers of the No to War, No to NATO campaign. Um, Ludo? Hello, you thank you. Thank you, Cora. Um, thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk about um, the Belgian situation. Uh, concerning nuclear arms. Uh, as you know, uh, and already has said, uh, Belgium is one of the five European countries with uh, US nuclear bombs on its soil. And in today's slide, it might be interesting to briefly outline how those weapons of mass destruction uh, got in my country and why it's so difficult to get rid of them. Uh, in 1962, a governmental law was voted to allow the free passage of NATO troops to the, through the Belgian territory as well as their stationing. And at the time, there was a Belgian member of parliament 
who wanted to add an article to exclude nuclear weapons under the provisions of the law. But the government convinced the initiator of the amendment to withdraw it, assuring him and other MPs that the deployment of nuclear arms would be, of course, only happen under parliamentarian authorization. But a year later, the US deployed secretly and uh, with governmental approval, nuclear gravity bombs on Belgian territory without any parliamentarian debate or permission. Um, and this incident, uh, I think, illustrates how democracy is inferior to military interests and strategies of the US and NATO. And until today, as already has been said, and it's in all uh, nuclear sharing countries, the government maintains a policy of ambiguity, neither confirming nor denying the presence of nuclear bombs in Belgium. And this is, of course, blocking any normal parliamentarian debate and public debate. However, it's no secret that about 150 uh, US B61 nuclear bombs have been deployed in five European countries as part of NATO's nuclear sharing policy. And it's Belgian fighter jets that are responsible for employing those uh, nuclear bombs in wartime, as, is, as it is the case for Germany, Italy and the Netherlands. And this is in breach, in my view, and in many views, with the non-proliferation treaty that prohibits the transfer or, to or the control over nuclear weapons by uh, non-nuclear weapon states. And these bombs will soon be replaced by new B-61-12 nuclear bombs as part of a $10 billion US modernization program. Um, because of their precision and low yield options, these nuclear weapons are considered usable, um, lowering the threshold for uh, nuclear war. Various surveys uh, show that uh, the majority of the Belgian population doesn't want nuclear bombs in Belgium. According to a recent, recent uh, survey last year, 77% of the population wants Belgium to join the TPNW. And you see the, main figure, the same kind of figures even up to 85% in Spain, in many uh, European countries. Even when the US were to exert pressure, still 66% are still in favor uh, for Belgium joining the TPNW. So the population's anti-nuclear weapons position was also translated be it cautiously, into the last governmental coalition agreement that was approved at the end of last summer, noting that Belgium, and I quote, that Belgium will play a proactive role in the 2021 NPT review conference uh, that will take place uh, in this summer. Um, and I, I continue the quote, together with European NATO allies, will explore how to strengthen the multilateral no proliferation framework and how the UN treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons can give new impetus to multilateral nuclear disarmament. As you see, it's very cautiously, but it's like a small open door for uh, discussing at least and eventually joining or signing the TPNW. Nevertheless, Belgium voted last year in December against the resolution in the General Assembly of the United Nations to welcome the, uh, that welcomed the TPNW and asking countries to exceed. So all NATO member states as Belgium uh, rejected this resolution. And this was a disappointment for the peace movement that is, has been very active and having this uh, opening door policy um, in the governmental coalition agreement. NATO is openly campaigning against the TPNW and global, and this, with this information even, and a global nuclear disarmament reg regime. According to a position of the North Atlantic Council last year uh, in December, uh, I quote, as long as nuclear weapons exist, NATO will remain a nuclear alliance. And there is a new report, uh, the famous NATO 2030 report, and I invite everybody to read it. It's a very Cold War document that will lay the foundation of the new NATO strategy at the upcoming NATO summit in Brussels. And that states, and I quote, NATO should continue and revitalize the nuclear sharing arrangements that constitute a critical element of NATO's deterrence policy. So there is no talk about disarmament, no even um, uh, plans to uh, engage uh, NATO and NATO member states in nuclear disarmament uh, discussions. 
The pressure from the US and NATO to maintain the nuclear deterrence is huge. The Belgian government is divided over the issue. Greens and Social Democrats, part of the government, want Belgium to remove the nuclear bombs and sign the TPNW. But another part, the Liberals and Christian Democrats of the government, want us to remain loyal to the NATO's nuclear sharing policy. And according to the Greens and Social Democrats, Belgium will play a proactive role at the next NPT review conference this summer and pledge to work within NATO for a new policy on nuclear weapons. But in my view, it looks like these parties don't want to get the government into trouble over nuclear weapons. So the peace movement, to conclude, is campaigning to pressure the government to be serious about nuclear disarmament and sign the TPNW with much local support, I have to say. Uh, last year, we had 150 mayors, we had 150 mayors from um, uh, cities and smaller communities that asked the government to sign the TPNW. Uh, soon, we will launch an official petition under the new uh, right of petition law to amend the 1962 law I mentioned before, so that the deployment of nuclear weapons in Belgium will at least need a parliamentarian consent. The Belgian peace movement participates actively in the new European Nuke Free Europe campaign uh, against NATO nuclear sharing policy and for the removal of all nuclear weapons in Europe. In Belgium, Germany, the Netherlands, and yesterday I heard from Francesco in, uh, from Italy that there will be actions near military bases with US nuclear weapons. Remember how similar campaigns against the deployment of nuclear missiles in Europe in the 80s resulted in mass movement, in a mass movement bringing millions of people into the street. And we will have, we will have to do a lot of work to uh, achieve the, main, the, the same results. But our first goal now is to get the nuclear arms back on the political, political agenda and to raise awareness among other movements like trade unions, climate movement, women and youth movement, and North-South movement about the planetary threat of nuclear weapons and the need to act. And so to finish, I recall the iconic slogan of Greenpeace, no time to waste. Thank you. Thank you, Ludo. Uh, that was uh, really a heartwarming uh, conclusion that you made. You know, there's no time to waste indeed. And, uh, and also for emphasizing the importance of uh, grassroots organizing, uh, which meant a lot uh, for many of us, uh, whether this was uh, from a long time ago or for, from the current uh, uh, situation, uh, we see that in... Uh, very clearly with our engagement with the people's movement. So uh, let me now call on uh, our uh, last but not the least uh, uh, panelist uh, this afternoon. I'd like to call on uh, Lisa Clark, uh, who is currently the co-president of the International Peace Bureau. Uh, she is uh, from uh, Italy uh, and uh, also um, very much involved with the local uh, uh, local organizing in Italy, uh, being a member of uh, uh, an organization called Blessed Are the Peacemakers, Viati uh, Constructori de Pace, <laughs> and a coalition, Rete uh, de uh, I think she will, she will tell us about that, uh, a, a coalition of, of peace movements in, in Italy. So uh, Lisa, you, you have the virtual floor. Thank you, Cora. Thank you. You didn't call me your senior, your senior colleague, but here I am. I am your senior colleague just as much as you were. Achin, thank you for the proposal. Um, Cora's, already meant, Cora's already mentioned this, but um, the International Peace Bureau would also be very, very interested in supporting that idea of yours, uh, of having the conference in Bangladesh, of supporting the single state nuclear weapon free uh, proposal or the South, you know, all of those proposals is very, very interesting. And we will be there at your side. Um, I am to tell you a little bit about what we have been doing in Italy. 
which is seems a sort of small and insignificant country next to what we've heard from Achin and uh, and uh, from Japan and so on. But uh, I I still think there is uh, information here that can be useful for everyone. It was only in 2005 that we found out that there were still some B61 gravity nuclear weapons in two bases in Italy, in Aviano and Gedi. We launched a political campaign then with questions asked in Parliament, but came up against a NATO style response. Do not confirm, do not deny the way Ludo has already told us. We continued, however, with an information campaign, especially focused on the legal, ethical and moral aspects of the presence of these nuclear weapons. In 2008, we submitted to Parliament enough notarized signatures to propose new legislation from civil society on establishing a nuclear weapon free single state like Austria. But that was never even debated. We promoted membership in Mayors for Peace for Italian cities and towns, and we now have over 500 members of Mayors for Peace in Italy. I think it's 520. During the Hiroshima and Nagasaki days, we organize events, including bike rides through towns, meeting city councils, encouraging them to vote resolutions in favor of the removal of nuclear weapons from Italian soil. And every year on the 9th of August, at the end of these events, we have a Nagasaki Day event in front of Aviano US Air Force Base, while our Hiroshima Day events are manifold in many cities throughout the country. No Italian government, either center-left or center-right, has ever wanted US nuclear weapons to be removed from Italian soil. Although in some cases they paid lip service to a world without nuclear weapons. The civil society campaign in favor of removing them started a long time ago, but lobbying gained momentum in 2016, when Italy voted against convening a conference in 2017 to discuss a banned treaty. Italy has a long tradition, its governments, of supporting disarmament agreements, but not in this case. Our campaign called Italia Ripensaci, which means Italy, change your mind, you've decided wrong on this issue, concentrated on education and information on the humanitarian initiative and the TPNW, on the ethical and legal issues. Up to now, more than 200 cities in Italy have approved council resolutions demanding that Italy sign the ban treaty. In many cases, approval in the city councils was unanimous, proving that the stigma is already having effect. If you know that in uh, ICANN campaigns for the ban treaty, we always maintained that the stigmatization of nuclear weapons is the cultural element that's gonna get us to the elimination and to the prohibition. Well, we've, we're finding in Italy that this works. And in fact, we found in small towns when uh, the resolution was debated by the city council, even the councillors representing those political parties that are more in favor of nuclear weapons shied away from saying so in public. Uh, so I think that that is something that can be useful elsewhere as well, something to think about. Opinion polls on nuclear weapons in 2019, uh, this is part of the opinion polls that we do together with the ICANN campaign, showed that 70% of Italians were in favor of joining the TPNW. But in 2020, the year, a year and a half afterwards, it was 87% that were in favor of Italy joining the TPNW. And this is evidence that the campaign had reached a lot of people. That's quite an increase in 17% more in just a year and a half. Our ICANN affiliated coalition has grown. The bishops of the seven Catholic dioceses in the part of Italy around the US Air Force Base at Aviano endorsed activities celebrating the entry into force of the TPNW on January the 22nd. In the province of Brescia, where the Gedi nuclear base is located, 165 grassroots NGOs also endorsed celebrations for entry into force, alongside 
56 local government authorities. Throughout Italy, many more cities printed our campaign's poster, which was a poster informing citizens of the entry into force of the TPNW. And it was hung in the city hall's public spaces, those spaces where uh, city administrations usually hang posters saying, we're going to have elections in two months time, do this, do that. And in this case, they just printed up saying, the TPNW has entered into force and we want Italy to join. So the events also on the 22nd of January, despite the restrictions imposed by the pandemic regulations, were promoted and attended by a broad range of organizations and individuals. And the church bells of dozens of churches rang out at midday to welcome the entry into force of the TPNW. It was reassuring and exciting to see that it is still possible to elicit enthusiastic engagement from civil society, from local government institutions, from the media, on issues that concern the whole of humanity. A moral and ethical commitment that has taken root in the majority of the Italian people, also thanks to the many meetings and interviews during which Hibakusha have told their stories. A resolution was passed in Parliament in 2017, requiring the Italian government to commission research into the legal consequences of Italy joining the ban treaty. Though this resolution was passed, nothing has ever been done. So this year, our campaign is pressing for another resolution on the same issue. And we will also ask for Italy to be represented at a, with a high level delegation at the first TPNW States Parties meeting in Vienna in January, 2022. Uh, Ludo mentioned that uh, Francesco told him in the meeting on the new Free Europe campaign that we will be having events in the month of September. And that is, I confirmed that, especially around Gedi, which is an Italian base, not Aviano, which is a, a US Air Force base. We want to concentrate really on the responsibility of Italy in this, uh, in this matter. And I think that our campaign shows that if you do an information campaign, the morality and the immorality of nuclear weapons is what is so striking for people. And nobody wants to be part of that kind of murderous crime against humanity immorality anymore. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. There, my friends, you know, uh, listening to our five panelists uh, uh, touching on uh, the different aspects of the TPNW, uh, whether uh, uh, taking it up historically or, uh, you know, movement wise, and uh, given us some very concrete proposals, uh, work that has been done uh, in the grassroots level up to the uh, uh, including to the UN. And I think the, the discussion has been very rich. And at this point, we have a, a few minutes to spend for our Q&A um, for some proposals. Uh, at this point, I'd like also to acknowledge we have our longtime friend here. I'm not going to say she is a senior uh, uh, advocate. Uh, I'd like to welcome uh, Ms. Edith Ballantyne, many of you must know her. Uh, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Um, I have, uh, I saw several questions here, but let me begin. I'm, I'm not going to take them uh, you know, in order it arrived, I think, uh, uh, but I, I would like to mention that uh, there is a support uh, for uh, the proposal of Achin uh, Van Eyck. Uh, in terms of the uh, um, his proposal on the on the uh, on on Bangladesh and South Asia, uh, coming from uh, uh, the leader uh, a leader from the IPPNW, and then I and I I kind of move on to a question that is actually specifically addressed to Ludo, 
um, uh, coming from uh, a, a Japanese friend, Emiko Hirano. Um, and let me read that question. I'm so impressed by citizens' uh, activism in Belgium um, for advancing nuclear disarmament and to press your government to become party to TPNW. Um, and I want to know in Belgium how women are involved in the anti-nuke movement. So would you like to take that, uh, Ludo? And uh, also, um, let me just read this already, uh, uh, coming from uh, mm, a question coming from Mr. Goto uh, of, uh, of, I don't know whether it, uh, hmm, I'm sorry. Okay, where is that? Uh, Mr. Goto of the Itoshima City, uh, who's a council uh, member, uh, the Japanese Communist Party, Chair Ashi Kazuo, uh, calls for the establishment of the Northeast Asia Pacific, uh, Northeast Asia Peace Cooperation Mechanism. And I believe this connection with what you are proposing uh, is, uh, is important. I also believe that Japan and Korea can take initiatives to advance uh, nuclear abolition once they become parties to the TPNW. Can you tell us your idea on how cooperation for peace in Northeast Asia is, should be? So I, I think any one of you can answer that, but since it speaks of Northeast Asia, maybe Jin Yang should take that first. And finally, uh, there is one more question. Oh, okay, uh, I, I think that's it. And maybe we can, uh, after uh, our our panelists have answered those two questions, then we can see uh, uh, who raised their hand and call on them to speak. Okay, so can we? Can I ask Ludo, please? Yes, thank you, Kora. Uh, well, concerning the situation in Belgium and the Belgian women movement, we have uh, uh, established uh, years ago a coalition. Um, a coalition. Um, uh, Belgian Coalition Against Nuclear Arms, and there are several women movements uh, active in it. Uh, and let's say the active members, I, th I, I think the majority of the active members of the Belgian Coalition, so in person, uh, are uh, women. So uh, let's say that women are uh, on the forefront in, in uh, the struggle against nuclear arms. But I have also to admit um, but it, this is not only for the women's movement, it's for climate movement, it's for, the, for all kinds of movements, even trade unions, um, that we still have a lot of work to do to convince them of the urgent need to uh, campaign against nuclear arms. They are part of the coalition, but, um, you know, it's, it's not always a priority. And, and of course, every uh, movement has its own priorities to work on. Uh, there is the pandemics, for example, and the climate movement, which is as urgent as it is. But we try to explain, yeah, you have cl climate and nuclear arms as a planetary uh, threat, and those uh, both threats need to be addressed as soon as possible because we cannot afford to, to, to wait uh, too long, yeah? time to waste. So, um, and this is also accounts for the, the women's movement. So, and this is what we are doing now. We are not only uh, publicly campaigning and mobilizing for our actions in September, um, but we also try uh, with this action to convince all those movements to be active, an active part of the mobilization and of the campaign in order to establish this uh, bigger movement and also to, to have this influence towards the uh, political uh, world uh, in, in bringing this also higher back on the political agenda. So I leave the second question to Achin. I think uh, he's more familiar with the issue. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> well, were, uh, can I, uh, Cora, should I speak? Uh, yeah, uh, and then after you would be Jin Yang. Okay. Um, yes, uh, well, there were two, uh, I think, uh, questions uh, referring to me. One from Charles Johnson uh, about uh, the IPPNW here, uh, Dr. Arun Mitra, who is the co-president. IPPW. In fact, even before this meeting, I had already talked to him about this. He pointed out that the IPPNW is probably having a meeting, international meeting, later this year in Kenya. But uh, 
this idea was also something that he approved of strongly. And since there is a, a, a Bangladesh section of the IPP and W, which could possibly act as a host, uh, and you have a government of Bangladesh, which could, given its history, would be very open to providing visas uh, to all kinds of people here. I think that's a very real possibility that we should definitely uh, work towards. The second thing, which is also sort of, I'd like to say something, but I would very much keen to hear what Kim uh, Jin Jung would say about this. And this was about the Northeast Asian situation in Korea. Well, let me just share my understanding of this. North Korea was part of the NPT and walked out. There was a time when North Korea said that they were for a denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. Now things are bad, but you still have a North Korean government, unlike any other nuclear weapon state, which says that we are prepared to get rid of our nuclear weapons. Why do they want to do this? In my view, it's very much connected to the realization that they have that if they are going to be able to have adequate development for their future, they're actually looking to countries like Japan in particular to help them out technically and aid-wise. But they cannot have better relations with Japan unless they normalize relations with the United States. Yes, the Chinese and the Russians can help them. But the Russians and the Chinese are too close. They're wary about it, etc. But if there can be an improvement in relations with Japan, which is contingent on getting rid of nuclear weapons, and the North Koreans have done silly things like testing and all that here. So how do you do that? The United States government, in my view, does not want to remove its conventional troops from that area. It wants to maintain it for strategic uh, reasons here. A peaceful settlement and normalization of their relations in North Korea would create problems for them. So the United States says denuclearize first. Actually, we should be calling on the United States to normalize political relations, arrange a peace treaty with North Korea, without demanding that this be preceded by a full denuclearization of the Korean Pisna. This can, and in my view, will follow a peace treaty and the permanent end to military hostilities between the two countries. The United States is by far the stronger country. The North Korea is much weaker. It wants an end to those hostilities. And this could also be a transformation in North-South relations. Please note that in the past, when there have been efforts towards this, the sunshine diplomacy period, where did Russia come against? When in Japan, there have been efforts to say, what about Okinawa, let's move away. What is the pressure coming from? So I want to suggest in a certain sense that pressure should be put on the United States to move towards a peace treaty or even do it simultaneously. You do this here and we'll do that here, but not insist on it being a precedent. And I think we could have a breakthrough possibly in the United States. But it also means that you have to get away. It means uh, uh, a lot of things. So that would be my view. I'll stop here. Thank you, Jin. Uh, can, can I have uh, Jin Yang, please? Yes. Um, sorry. I'm sorry. Can you hear me clear now? Or is it still too weak? OK. OK. Uh, we in PSSP believe in something called active positivism or unilateralism, which means we should make disarmament moves first in order to make others to others do the same thing. That's why I want to want the South Korean government to join the DPNW, making it levers for North Korea's denuclearization. And Japan's joining the treaty will be also very helpful. And in addition, I mentioned in my speech that Japan's peace, peace constitution and three non-nuclear principles, because I think it is a good example for, of unilateralism that declare peace not war first. And I think we both to Korea's builds that should build such measures too to realize this idea, 
I believe solidarity between Korean and Japanese people is essential. Actually, my very recent concern is there is some atmosphere among the Moon Jae-in administration to use the Fukushima contaminated water issue to provoke nationalist anger in Korea and gain the support of people. Of, of course, that's a very bad direction and can never be a solution. Solidarity is the only answer to all of these issues. issues. I believe so. Thank you, Jin Yang. Uh, I don't know whether Ambassador Hainos is still here, uh, but there is a, there are two more questions that uh, I see in the chat box. Um, was uh, practical questions, I think, about uh, you know uh, where to get the reference for Austria's uh, nuclear-free constitution. Um, uh, uh, asking where this can be accessed. And the other would be uh, in information on uh, uh, how are you preparing for the upcoming NTP review uh, in August? Uh, this is a question coming from Mr. Watanabe of Ehime uh, Prefecture. Uh, so can uh, Ambassador Hainots uh, respond to those two questions now? Yeah, well, uh, regarding the first question, uh, the Austrian constitution as such uh, is many decades old, but we always add to it through constitutional laws. And this constitutional law is from 1999. And uh, I assume you, you might be able to find it uh, on, on the internet because we do not add so many constitutional laws constantly. Uh, uh, so uh, the, 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 I hope you, you will find it. Uh, uh, if not, uh, uh, you, you, you can send me an email. Uh, uh, the second question uh, concerning the first meeting of states parties, uh, what is the concrete uh, uh, question there? Uh, the question is, how are you preparing for the upcoming NPT yeah. review conference in August? Oh, for the NPT review conference. Well, mm -hmm. of course, we are um, preparing. I think uh, uh, at this moment, we are not even quite sure whether it will be possible uh, to hold uh, the conference in August. This will be decided now pretty soon in a couple of weeks, depending on pandemic, uh, travel possibilities. Uh, uh, so uh, it would be very important that this uh, 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 review conference is not a scaled down uh, uh, short uh, conference uh, that we do just because we have to do it uh, for procedural reasons. I, th I think we need a real debate, including, of course, civil society. So that's from, from the Austrian perspective very important and uh, uh, what is most important of course is that we reaffirm the, the given commitments in the past uh, outcome documents, no walk away and make progress, add to this. There are some areas perhaps where it would be possible. Uh, uh, think of risk reduction which, which is very important but of course uh, more than strategic risk reduction that uh, presupposes that uh, uh, we should also in the future have nuclear weapons, but uh, perhaps in a, a little bit safer way. We have to make progress towards real nuclear disarmament. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. And at this point, um, I'd like to say that I'm not going to attempt to uh, you know, summarize the discussion. It is rich enough. But uh, we have a lot of very rich chat uh, uh, entries here, and uh, we are taking note of that, and uh, uh, we'll include them in a, in, a, in a communication with you. We have actually 188 uh, uh, registered participants. Uh, and as we said at the beginning that this uh, webinar is uh, 
is being recorded uh, and therefore it is going to be made available um, on, a, on a later date uh, and uh, we will let you know about that. Uh, at, and I would like to thank at this point our our uh, speakers, our panelists uh, for taking time out from their busy schedule, Ambassador Hynotes, uh, uh, Achin Vanaik, uh, Jin Yang Kim, Ludo, uh, Lisa, and uh, Yayoi, uh, particularly uh, my appreciation and gratitude to Yayoi who has taken the lead in uh, organizing this webinar. Uh, and uh, we are happy that uh, we have been able to come together. Uh, and before um, I, uh, I close the, uh, the session, I'd like us to remember two particular dates in the coming months. Uh, one is that the Asia Europe People's Forum is going to happen in May seven, on May 17 to 24. Uh, because of the pandemic, it is going to be online. You will be informed about the schedules. Uh, some of you, I think, will be speaking in these webinars uh, uh, in the different clusters. And the second uh, date that I'd like you to remember and not to forget is uh, that you're all uh, invited to join the International Peace Bureau as it holds it's a second World Peace Congress in Barcelona, Spain in October, October 15 to 17 of this year. So hopefully by that time, you know, we could all go to Barcelona and, uh, and, uh, <laughs> and be part of the Congress. Uh, you know, we hold this only every five years. So it is also important for us. Um, and uh, of course, um, uh, uh, I hope that you will visit the AEPF uh, website. It's very easy to remember, aepf.org. So that's the, uh, and you will find oh, everything, uh, the past <laughs> and the time. future uh, uh, events that are going to take place, especially in, in, uh, in May, in, in, in next month. Uh, so you're all invited to join us. Uh, let us know if you'd like to speak in one of those uh, webinars uh, of peace and security. So thank you very much, uh, friends. And uh, um, I hope that we will get to see each other again in the future, face to face this time. Uh, in the meantime, uh, let us all uh, continue to, uh, to work and, and, and to to uh, be engaged uh, in whatever way we can, even if we are <laughs> we are confined in our offices and in our homes. So thank you very much and um, take care. <laughs>